it's common to decompose time series into three separate components, trend, seasonal, and cyclical. Throughout the main part of the course, we focused on the cyclical component, and in particular, we spent a lot of time discussing ARMA model construction, estimation, and forecasting. We didn't put in significant effort into discussing modeling trends and seasonal components. This series of lectures will extend our knowledge to include more sophisticated models that allow for the conditional mean to vary across time through time trends or through seasonal dummies, as well as to extend our understanding of seasonal autoregressions and moving averages. We'll conclude by putting everything together into a unified framework known as SEREMA, Seasonal Autoregressive Integrated Moving Averages, that allow us to have all three components together in a single model. Throughout, we assume that we observe t data points, x1 through xt. Our interest in particular, and the interest of the entire course, is going to be on forecasting xt plus h given t, that is the h step ahead forecast, given the information available at time t. We'll often be making forecasts for multiple horizons, for example, t plus 1, t plus 5, t plus 10, t plus 12 for monthly data, and so on. Time trend models are fundamentally very simple. A basic time trend model has a constant, beta naught, and a time trend, beta 1, multiplied by t, which is the time trending variable. It's typical to use the values 1, 2, and so on up to cap t to capture the time trend, although it makes no difference in terms of the, the sensitivity to the time trend if you use other values such as the year, the only condition is that these values need to be regularly spaced, or at least reflect the difference of time in the actual observed observations. If you use a different series, for example the year, it'll change the intercept in the model, but as long as you're consistent, it makes no difference for forecasting, and you'll have the exact same forecasts or any other values from the model. It's also, of course, possible to consider higher order trends. In the next model, we consider a linear time trend, beta 1t, as well as a quadratic time trend, beta 2 t squared. In practice, we don't usually consider trends higher than second order, and in fact, second order trends themselves can be very risky when it comes to forecasting models, and so they're rarely used, except in cases where there's a sort of unquestionable need for a quadratic time trend. In fact, even linear time trends themselves can be very dangerous when you're forecasting over longer horizons, and we'll see later in the course that some of the more sophisticated methods make particular assumptions or use particular constructions to limit the impact of trends while not completely eliminating them. If you find that you need to use a quadratic or a cubic or some sort of higher order trend, this is usually an indication that you should be modeling the natural logarithm of x rather than x itself. An alternative to modeling series and levels is to model series and logs. Obviously, if you model the log of x as a linear time trend, this implies an exponential model for x itself, so the log model, which is just a standard linear model, becomes an exponential multiplicative model, beta naught, exp of beta 1t times epsilon t. This model is particularly easy to estimate as well, because we simply log the x data, and then we use OLS. Forecasting linear trend models and levels is particularly easy. We can see that the h step ahead forecast is simply going to be beta naught plus beta 1, times t plus h. So there's actually nothing to do. It's extremely simple, and time trend forecasting is probably one of the simplest things we've, we've seen throughout the entire course. We're also often interested in what are known as prediction intervals. This is the first time we've talked about prediction intervals. Before, we always talked about point forecasts of the mean, but didn't talk about trying to quantify the uncertainty. Prediction intervals are standard in many forecasting applications where you want to have some measure of how certain you are about the future value. It's common, for example, to use a 95% prediction interval. A 95% prediction interval should contain the true value 95% of the time. Throughout this set of slides, we'll make a simplifying assumption that the residuals in the model are normally distributed. This, of course, lets us use the quantiles of a normal distribution. In the case of a time trend, the prediction intervals are particularly simple. They only depend on the forecast value, xt plus h, 1.96, which we know gives us the 95% quantiles, the quantiles that give us the 95% in the center of a normal distribution. So we do 1.96, 1.96. We know that the area in the center of the normal 
is 95%, and then sigma. So in fact, the prediction intervals of a linear time trend model, if we have a trend say, for example, that is increasing over time, that the prediction interval is actually constant around the trend. This is mostly a fact of we don't have any autoregressive or moving average dynamics in the model, and so residuals don't persist across multiple periods. This, of course, is a simplifying assumption, and once we move to more sophisticated models that include both time trends and cyclical components, this won't be true, although the time trend itself won't add any particular complications to the construction of the forecast prediction interval. When we have exponential trends, we need to make some additional assumptions, or at least make use of one essential assumption. The assumption we use, or is consistently used, is to assume that the errors, again, are normally distributed, mean zero, and variant sigma squared. Once we have normal residuals of the model, we're going to have that the actual forecast variable ourself, that is xt plus h given t, is going to be log normally distributed. This is a really simplifying assumption. In particular, we know that if, if xt plus h is normally distributed, if we take the exponential of it, which of course this is just exp of the natural log of x hat t plus h given t, which is just x hat t plus h given t, then this will be log normally distributed with the same parameters. There are two options to construct forecasts when you have model the log of the series rather than the level. The first, and in practice a very common assumption, is to use the median forecast rather than the mean. The median forecast is extremely simple because it's just the exponential of the forecast of the log variable. So I could have written this expression as the exponential of, if I take log, x hat t plus h given t, and that's it. So in other words, I just construct a standard forecast of the model, and instead of worrying about any Jensen's inequality or any other things, I just exponentiate it. Under the assumption of normality, we have that x hat t, the log of x hat t plus h given t is normally distributed. So we know that the mean of it will be equal to the median. Nonlinear transformations like the exponential preserve quantiles. They don't preserve moments, but they preserve quantiles. And so the median of the log of x hat, when I exponentiate it, will also be the median of x hat. This is a simple assumption and doesn't require us to have any knowledge about the variance, which would be another parameter that we'd have to estimate when we want to use the alternative method. The alternative method uses the mean. In particular, it exploits this relationship that I just mentioned, that if the log of x hat is normally distributed, then x hat itself is log normally distributed. Well, we know that the mean depends on the mean parameter, beta naught plus beta one t plus h, but it also depends on half the variance. So we have to inflate the mean by this term. This happens, of course, because the exponential is a convex function, and Jensen's equality will tell us that the expectation of the exponential is larger than the expectation, the ex, excuse me, is larger than the exponential of the expectation. In practice, if you want to construct prediction intervals from forecasts made from log series, in particular for modeling, the natural log, in particular for modeling the natural log, in particular for modeling the natural log, x hat t plus h given t, then the prediction interval is just the exponential of the original prediction interval of the log series. Again, this exploits the fact that quantiles are preserved under nonlinear transformations such as exponential. So if we think about the log x hat having normal, so of course I have, a, I have two quantiles, which are easy to get, plus minus 1.96 sigma. Then we're gonna take the exponential of that. What we know is that the distance, the probability between these two values is still gonna be, should be 95% under our assumption. So that when I exponentiate this and I end up with a log normal distribution, which is skewed, and I take the two points, then the probability in the center of the distribution should still be 95%. Of course, this will not be a symmetric distribution. It will be asymmetric in the levels. Of course, it's symmetric in the logs because it's normal. It's asymmetric in the levels. But you know, it's not always possible to construct a symmetric prediction interval for the level when you use a log model. 
at least one that has a positive lower bound. This is simply a fact that when you have a skewed distribution, it may be possible that the value below the mean, in fact, doesn't actually have enough probability to allow you to, to ever construct a symmetric confidence interval. So you end up with a sort of nonsensical confidence interval that would say forecast would, would allow the possibility of negative values just to have symmetry. So in practice, we don't try to enforce symmetry when we have log models, and we just use the exponential of the quantiles to construct our prediction intervals. This lesson has talked about trends. These are extremely common in many time series, and modeling them is essential to producing accurate forecasts, especially along multi-step horizons. Trend models, or pure trend models, only require using OLS, which is a desirable feature. In practice, we try to limit trends to linear models in forecasting. Higher order for models, excuse me. In practice, we try to limit trends to linear models in forecasts. High order models tend to produce forecasts that have become very wild, especially at long horizons. And if you find you're looking at a higher order model, it's useful to consider whether it's possible to log the data first, which may require a weaker specification of the trend. Again, one of the key choices, which we talked about in this, this section, is whether we forecast the level or the log. Forecasting the log is extremely common because we know that, of course, if we log the data and then if we difference it, we get the growth rate. Log is usually something we want to do when we have series that are strictly positive. Um, in fact, many algorithms will always log data that's strictly positive without even considering whether the log is a better fit than the level. We talked about how forecasts of log data are constructed. There are two methods described, the median method and the mean method. The median method is simpler. It doesn't require any knowledge about the variance and in fact is more common than the mean despite the theoretical attractiveness of the mean. The median is also simpler because it doesn't really require us to make such a heroic assumption about the errors being normally distributed. In fact, if the errors are symmetrically distributed, such that the mean of epsilon is equal to zero, excuse me, such that the median of epsilon is equal to zero, then taking the exponential and using the median forecast will also be correct. Finally, prediction intervals are easy to construct in either case.